equity in play that is giving everybody an opportunity where they are able to play together. So there has to be a conscious effort uh, in terms of recruitment, in terms of the people that you bring in and sensitizing people on the importance of DE and I as we move forward. So these are just opening thoughts and as we get in, we can discuss more. No, I think you make a very valid point. Numbers games, and that's something we also hear the most about. It's easiest thing to kind of put about, uh, put in front uh, when you are talking about diversity, right? Say, you know, 50% uh, women, um, 30% uh, dis uh, disabled, differently able people. Um, but of course, you know, there are more nuances to that conversation. Like, I would like to now bring in Dr. Nagabhushanam to the conversation. If I can ask you the same thing, could you just share some of your observations regarding diversity and inclusion or some things, um, actions that you have taken in your institute? Actually, I'm extremely happy that uh, uh, this conclave has touched on DE and I. Because in most of the uh, conclaves, we take up uh, several of the topics, but uh, this is not touched in the B schools. Corporates, as uh, uh, Sheikh said, it's already there. And then uh, there are uh, policies in the corporates with respect to DE, DE and I. Uh, See, whenever something is not there, like for example, if you see the Shanti Mantra, so we end up in uh, saying Shanti, Shanti, Shanti. That means we aspire to have that Shanti. So when DEI is really not there, then we'll ha we aspire really to have this kind of diversity, equity and inclusion in institutions. But superficially, it appears that everything is very fine. But if you go deep in organizations, deep into the minds of people, then you will realize that you are really not an inclusive organization. So what needs to be done is that, so right from awareness to action, so creating a sort of awareness in the minds of the people, because today it is necessary that we need to talk about this and take it forward, otherwise it will be subtle and it will be brushed under the carpet. So instead of that, we need to raise this and hence we have created a DEI policy and we have uh, collaborated with one organization called as Avatar. Avatar is also a DEI organization. We have collaborated with them and we have created a policy and what we are trying to do is that right from your logo, right from your uh, promo lines, right from your emails, the tone of the email. So whatever we are doing with respect to the timings of the institution, with respect to allowing students to the class. So here there is a need for understanding each and every individual, whether it is a student, whether it's a faculty, whether it's an employee or any other stakeholder of the institution, we need to look from the DEI angle. So this is actually missing and at Ramaya Institute of Management, we are making conscious efforts to see that there is an inclusive approach and uh, like for example, even the logos, you know, we need to, for example, this logo, the future of management education. The first thing which came to me, my mind was that how this could be made more inclusive. Okay, so this kind of an approach, it is not only about gender, it is not only about the social classes, but there are several of these areas which are not touched. Uh, even the uh, mental models are there, uh, taboos are there. So these have to be broken to bring a very inclusive uh, kind of an environment in the organization. This is what we are trying to do. Thank you. Well, thank you for sharing that. And, you know, we are always open to feedback as all of us should be when we're dealing with, you know, there's, they're called sensitive issues, but it really should be normal topics of conversation. Now, I would like to bring in, you know, Professor Ramamurthy as we are sharing a mic right now. Can you, please, your entry comments. I think to me, the issue of diversity is more about <coughs> integration as opposed to the numbers game, you know, that most of them actually play. Whenever I report uh, to government and other agencies, uh, how many, I said, you know, why are we dividing the society or segmenting the society? I think that is a big problem personally to me. 
uh, in terms of gender, in terms of uh, economic classes, in terms of so when we do this, uh, being a autonomous body under the government of India, like we have to have this reservation for everything. So I said, what is it? So in a sense, you know, it is being forced on us to play the numbers game, which is a major issue. Uh, to me, diversity is about uh, level playing field for everyone, uh, equal opportunity for everyone, a fair treatment of everyone. In fact, you know, when I drafted the, I, we, I didn't give it to anybody else. So it was done internally when we drafted our uh, diversity policy and uh, harassment policy. It, it is much broader. I mean, although it was done for uh, Porsche Act, I made intentionally that it is much broader than the Porsche Act. You know, it covers LGBT, it covers about gender, about um, uh, the caste, uh, creed, religion, right? So it is one thing to have the policy. I think the other thing is to also like ensure that the policy is implemented. And uh, um, what should I say that uh, it is perceived by people, you know, that this is a fair place to work. Okay. Uh, in the process, I have no problem in sharing that I have gotten rid of some senior administrators and faculty members when they engaged in some sort of anti-diversity activity or creating a or vitiating the environment, I terminated the contact. I said, here's a door for you. I didn't do it straight away. I said, a couple of times I cautioned them. When it continued, I said, you know, enough is enough. I think now I believe the message has gone very clearly. I mean, I do actually talk to people. And in fact, they come and tell me that, you know, we want you to continue for five more years because we have a very fair uh, work environment here. I think the basic thing I believe uh, that students or whoever it is, is that we all come to the workplace uh, to earn a livelihood for ourselves and our families. And um, we have aspirations and career, um, career aspirations, personal aspirations, personal development. I think those should, those should never be hindered. And in fact, we should encourage that uh, in the process. And even in my senior administrators, like heads of the department, uh, selection committees, we conscious, I consciously personally review the committee and then make sure that it is diverse so that nobody feels left out. I think that is what I would call as an inclusiveness uh, is that you know nobody should feel left out or where somebody cannot go and uh, you know talk to anybody. I mean my uh, whether it's a pun in my office or officers, any of them can just knock on my door and come and talk to me right with any concerns that they have. I do accept that, you know, we still have a longer way to go, right? I mean, I cannot be sitting in the office uh, policing or monitoring everything, single thing that happens on the campus. But whenever things come to my uh, attention, those are dealt with, uh, um, I mean, they are taken very seriously and acted upon so that no one feels uh, left out. No, absolutely. It's a shared responsibility and everyone, if everyone follows it, that's the only way we can move forward. And uh, thank you for sharing those uh, concerns. You also have, you know, one more point. I just uh, forgot to mention this. You know, when I drafted the policy, I also made that if anybody comes becomes aware of a harassment or uh, uh, bad behavior by anybody and failing to report also can invite disciplinary action. Okay. So you just cannot say that, you know, no, no, like it is for them to find out. I think it is equally your responsibility to come and tell me you know, that uh, this is happening in the organization and uh, what are you doing about it? I think I would like to know that uh, from the employees and students. Yes, of course, speaking out when you, something bad happens is very, very important. I think that's uh, not just for diversity or inclusion. I think we can say that from across the board for every sector, every situation. Um, uh, Professor Jahan, I would like to invite you into the conversation now. Please uh, tell us your inputs. Uh, yeah, yes, sorry, Dr. Jahan, my apologies. Hello. Yeah. Good afternoon to everyone present here. First of all, let me, the outset, let me thank Business World for this opportunity where all management, uh, the management institute directors are here sharing their experience and trying to bring a lot of changes in management education. And this topic, inculcating uh, diversity and inclusion in B school is very prominent because it is not just uh, diversity and inclusion, it is three dimension, diversity, equity and inclusion, which is expanding like anything from past, uh, uh, from past few years. Uh, 
not only in uh, academic institution but also in corporate sector and everyone is trying to work on this but uh, what exactly is happening here why it is important it is more important in b school because b schools are educating students those who are going to enter the global uh, uh, global talent uh, who are going to become the future leaders and the, the future leaders is full of managing the diversity so if we are not inculcating how to manage diversity in them how they will be able to manage that is why the more responsibility is on b schools that is one thing and the next thing what i feel is uh, the b school is uh, uh, also has need to play a very pivotal role in the movement of uh, uh, an economy towards a very equity which is having a just and inclusiveness but at present what is happening is diversity happens by chance it is a number game as per the requirement of the accreditation as per the requirement of uh, various norms you need to have people from across uh, across part of the country and across gender so it is uh, so the number is getting fulfilled but how are they feeling are we uh, uh, whether they are inclusive whether they are inclusive in this they should feel happy they should feel they should get the sense of belongingness and they should feel that their voice is heard they are respected they are not discriminated are they feeling that so that is where the b schools have to work correct so in our school what we are doing basically is we have uh, uh, students from marginalized uh, uh, population and we have some students who are uh, especially able the first thing what we do is we try to treat them on par with the normal students so that there should not be any discrimination same classroom same teacher same setup they'll be learning the course so they never feel they are different so that is how we are trying to use the inclusivity in the institute so th that is what we believe we should be doing it they and uh, uh, every year we have some two students or uh, two or three students who will be like that and they have been taken care and to bring up the gender uh, diversity and to bring up the regional diversity we ensure that we have uh, dei clubs which is established in our institute which uh, conduct lot of program to inform or to discuss about the various cultural activities how different it is because the awareness about the diversity is very important so these culture these clubs take up those activities and here we have teachers as well as students as a representative those are driving this correct and uh, right from the orientation uh, till students are there with us every time this is something which we take care and we ensure that the students uh, not only are learns about it but they adopt to it and they practice it and they are going to uh, carry this in their corporate work so yeah absolutely i mean i think uh, you said it really well you know the diversity is already there inclusion becomes the important part within the institute at least for students for faculty for staff members all parties involved professor rao i would like to bring you in now you've heard what all of our other panelists have had to say on it um what are your comments on this what are your observations uh good evening to one and all i totally agree with my panel members because diversity is the thing that every school need to maintain because a school has got the responsibility of preparing the students for the corporate world and when the corporates are talking about sustainable development and inclusiveness and the institutes are the feeder points for the organizations thereby we need to sensitize the students uh, who are undergoing the management program about diversity equity and the inclusiveness uh especially schools you know all schools must be having the cultural clubs and the dei clubs and all uh basically these clubs will uh, provide a platform for students to respect the culture of the other uh, states and also the the practices and the traditions that the uh, each state or the each individual is having right from the uh, college or the institute itself if they are aware of they are sensitized hopefully the same culture can be replicated once they join in the organization thereby the problem of uh, discrimination or rather you know ill treatment these things can be avoided and certain biases that are there can be eliminated in the entire process so i strongly feel that yes business schools have got a greater responsibility 
to take care of these DAI aspects of it. Absolutely. I would like to come back to Mr. Sheikh on this now. You know, everyone has spoken about how for corporates, you know, this diversity and inclusion and these uh, markers are very, very important. And as B-Schools work so closely with the industry, it can be difficult, I imagine, to balance that diversity, inclusion, but also preparing students for a very specific kind of set of skills that will get them the kind of jobs, careers that they're looking for. How do you meet this challenge? So, honestly, it's not very difficult because I think uh, this is a lifestyle mindset that we need to kind of inculcate into the citizens of today and tomorrow. Uh, so, at Lexicon, um, this process starts very early. You know, forget B-Schools, uh, which is Lexicon Mile. We started with our children when they're in school itself. You know, where they're very, very careful in terms of the verbiage that is uh, utilized in terms of conversations that a teacher has with the students. When children are speaking to each other, very careful that, you know, we don't make any loose comments. Because this is what children pick up very, very easily and very quickly. Um, I'll give you another example that what we do at Lexicon, like our students in the undergrad and our B schools learn Indian Sign Language. It means they have a 30-hour certification that kind of makes them know that. So, for example, if they are in a situation where there is a communication required with somebody who's impaired uh, in terms of uh, a hearing impairment or a speech impairment, they're equipped to take a conversation forward. Similarly with Braille, right? So our, our B-School students at Lexicon Mile are getting equipped to understand not only every need that is there in the uh, uh, corporate community today, but we also encourage them to be entrepreneurs. You know, when, And when you are doing that, it's very important that you have a value system in a company that you are starting off. And, and hence, diversity and inclusion and equity play a big role in that. And if we are able to make that a regular mindset versus you know something that we are teaching, uh, what it does is we've got better citizens coming out. Uh, you've got citizens who will define our country in the way that we want, which sits down with our thing one. You know, we're talk and we're talking about it with the whole presidency at G20, right? one world one community and that's what you want out there and that's what you want to kind of encourage and inculcate and promote and drive no absolutely thank you for sharing that uh dr jahan you know you mentioned that you have so many different clubs and uh, initiatives already in place what kind of feedback have you received from students on this and what has it taught you about the way um sensitization is kind of done at universities and institutes yeah uh, students, they are also happy about it. Like they are, uh, they are getting an opportunity to learn about different cultures. They are getting an opportunity to understand each other and how to bring the unity among all the different differences what they have and a lot of learning is happening so students are very happy about it and uh, we just started the club but more activities are added by students. They, they, they just come back and say this is something which has to be taken care of. Okay, this is something where college can play a role or institution can play a role or maybe the student can add value. So that kind of feedback students are giving. And uh, not only that, uh, we also have uh, corporate interaction with the students. The student asks for having some interaction on DE about the corporate and checking what practices the, uh, the business firms are following in order to have DA in their organization and trying to learn from them and incorporate so overall students feel it is something what they have to adopt a need of the day. A lot of interest they are feeling in it. That is why we are trying to add this as a part of curriculum. So whatever the case studies we are discussing or whatever the topics we are discussing, we are trying to bring in the different cultures and the different aspects of diversity and inclusion and how it can be engaged, how creativity and innovation can be achieved through these three edge weapons. So what exactly has to be done? So students are very happy about it and a lot of activities are initiated by them and uh, they really feel that, yes, they should become part of this. I can imagine that really adds to their confidence also, which is very important when you are going about creating a professional career for yourself. Yes. Thank you. Professor Rao, I, I want to uh, ask you this uh, too. You know, um, when you're working with corporates, uh, because you mentioned corporates obviously are a big part of this, um, is there a need to have a dialogue with them too, like between university and the corporates about this diversity and inclusion, so they can kind of understand what you are bringing to the table 
which so that the onus doesn't completely fall on the individual students to kind of you know prove their own worth, which is difficult to do when all you are doing is one interview or two interviews. Uh, definitely, there must be a connect with the corporate and a dialogue must be opened up and we should inform them the kind of uh, diversity in terms of the students that we have in the campuses. Sometimes, you know, the organization do accept because when they are very keen on taking the students of, uh, you know, different gender. So at that time, yes, they will specifically say, I need this uh, kind of, you know, students the male or the female kind of a ratio will come into the picture. In all other cases, they normally come and see the students merit and based on that the employment would happen. But by and large, when the organizations are looking for the diversity in their own organizations, they definitely see the gender is the one aspect and the other one is the region wise, you know, they try to take the students. So thereby, you know, they can maintain their gender parity as per the corporate norms. So definitely institute should, uh, you know, have a dialogue. And in fact, the organizations would ask the profile of the students and wherein all the details are being mentioned and through that they uh, go with their own selection process. No, it's absolutely. And, you know, so that you can also sort of like, yes, you know, play into the number numbers game, but also make sure that, you know, student aspirations are being met, their skills are being utilized. Yes. Um, Dr. Uh, Nagabhushan, I would like to bring you into this too now because we talk, talked a lot about students, but you know, faculty sensitization is also really important. It's not just, you know, one player. We have to make sure everyone is sort of, you know, on the same page. Uh, what steps have you taken in the Institute to ensure this? Yeah, uh, as you said, uh, faculty is one link that really can bring uh, this kind of an inclusiveness in the institution. Uh, we conduct uh, sensitization programs, even mentoring, you know, when uh, we ask uh, faculty to mentor. So we have, we do sensitization programs for faculty and then uh, uh, make them understand. It's not about just putting some uh, pressure on the faculty and trying to tell them that you have to follow these things. So it's not about that. So we need to sensitize. We'll have to make them understand how to be neutral in their uh, talk, when they address the students, because there is a tendency for the faculty to be uh, just top down, like advice, give advice to the students. So we fail to understand the needs of the students at that point in time. So sensitization plays a very uh, important role, a key role. And we have been conducting several of these uh, programs for the faculty so that first we'll have to address the faculty and then only if we address this link, you know, then the students can really benefit out of the whole uh, process as to what we are imagining about an organization with a uh, hundred percent uh, inclusive approach. So this, uh, we have been conducting several programs and then we have people coming from different organizations and coming and speaking to our uh, uh, faculty about this and a regular, a regular mentoring program for the faculty. This is also one thing. We have uh, two psychologists uh, on campus and uh, they are also one-on-one. Uh, -on -one. We are uh, addressing the faculty as to how to handle situations with the students. Because we always, when there is a problem, you know, we always tend to give some solution. So solution is not the uh, final thing. Faculty cannot work on giving some prescriptions to the students rather than understanding the situation, understanding the needs and being neutral and trying to use a language which is uh, more uh, friendly, more uh, inclusive and uh, more uh, required in that particular situation. I can imagine that can be difficult sometimes, especially with uh, people who have been doing this job for a long time to like come in and be like, we need you to change how you <laughs> speak yeah, and yeah, communicate. Uh, yeah, um, in almost in the entire education st sector itself, we have been used to this uh, top-down approach. So even, even in the classrooms, even uh, when, uh, when we are discussing uh, with students one-on-one, -on -one, so we have a top-down approach which we have uh, been following. I think that reversal has to happen, that bottom-up approach has to be followed. In a teacher-student relationship, we have to put student as a priority. We have to understand the outcomes, why the student is here, what are his needs, 
his or her needs and how that has to be addressed so this kind of a empathy okay so i don't know if you have heard of this empathy institute there is a empathy institute wherein uh, uh, they try and uh, teach people as to how to become more empathetical right so putting yourself in the shoes of others so we consider them uh, with thirst on people as to whatever is our idea but always listening to their problems their ideas and uh, trying to uh, have a neutral approach is very very critical it's a difficult task but it takes time so i can say that we have achieved to the extent of some 50 to 60% so 100% achievement is not possible overnight because some engravings in the mind you know would have happened in the faculty also slowly step of the one step after the other we can take and change the minds of the faculty also in this direction yeah it's part of the continuous learning ongoing learning that everyone keeps yes, talking yes. about um professor ramamurthy i'm going to give you the last word in this panel you know you spoke a lot about you know all the different kinds of you know ways we have to be inclusive um you know the you have the gender of course orientation age physical ability caste creed the list goes on is there a way for us to be diverse be inclusive without putting people into boxes like you spoke about earlier see it's easier said than done okay i think sometimes uh, let me also give you another perspective that you know i spent the last 30 years in the us my first 30 years in india so when i went there you know things were completely different for me but i think the 30 years something has in, uh, gotten into me i don't see anybody as a, a male or female or as a minority or you know the um, christian or any such thing that i treat everybody as uh, equal sometimes i do find it difficult in indian context like even after coming back although we have made a lot of progress that you know we tend to create these artificial boxes that's why i said like you know after creating these artificial boxes and then trying to uh, integrate them right becomes a, a little bit more challenging um in many cases <clears throat> um i think the message i it's not just like you know you do a past training because the law requires you to do it i think in almost every academic council meetings in personal interaction with people i keep sending this message to everyone you know that uh, um we have to have uh, treat everybody with respect and dignity in the workplace and uh, non discrimination fair opportunity so that message keeps going back and forth i think the other thing that i have seen in the past three two or three years here is that you know it it is our ability to separate the interpersonal issues from diversity issues to me these two are two different things like for example if a male and female faculty members don't get along we have a tendency to make that as a gender issue so what do you do if two female faculty members are not getting along well with each other so obviously it's not a gender issue or uh, when uh, someone comes and says oh if so and so is going to be the program director i don't want to be part of it okay this comes from both male and female faculty members so then i have to really focus on the person and then say like you know look whatever you are doing your either your behavior or your attitude you know there is something that people don't like to work with you you know therefore you need to change that so it is quite a complex phenomenon i would say you know that uh, the other alternative sometimes is like you know people tend to make something uh, a mountain out of a mole and then you know so and so like you know said something you know even in, i mean i can tell you that sometimes not consciously but subconsciously uh, we have i have done that mistake i am not going to deny that <laughs> it's not with the intention to discriminate or anything is that when i see that somebody formally addressed i ask Oh, is there a, any event going on in the institute? Because not every, you know, in IIMs, almost like you know, there are so many activities, so many interviews, uh, panels come, like you know, conclaves. So I am not there for each and every one of them. Okay, most of the time they are done. If I am there, they, I get invited. So okay, if I am free, I go. Okay. So I don't want. I didn't want. I mean, immediately I apologize, saying that look, you know, this is not what I meant. I'm just curious, like if something I. should have known but i am not aware of okay 
I think that is the most important thing that our ability to separate the interpersonal uh, issues from uh, diversity issues. Uh, the numbers will be there for uh, some more years. <laughs> Until such time, you know, we have uh, ac- really reached that uh, this is a mental attitude and maturity that, you know, the this is a fairly integrated society. That's Absolutely. when it will And happen. being able to take that criticism and to learn from it and take that feedback. Uh, Mr. Sheikh, you've heard what all your um, co-panelists have had to say. Would you like to add anything to some, uh, some of their comments? You, one of the elements that we've uh, just kind of just just touched upon is the unconscious bias. You know, uh, whilst uh, you know we are very aware a lot of times of things that we should do, not do, and we kind of talk about it, but the our brain is wired in a su- certain way from childhood, and that kind of applies for everybody, right? Um, with all that we want to kind of do in the DEI space, there's a certain amount of rewiring that is required, which means that a little bit of elimination of the unconscious bias that has kind of sat in. You know, you hear this comment so loosely so many times uh, when you're driving that lady drivers are bad. Now, imagine that, right? You're sitting in the car, you've got a child sitting at the back of it and he's heard one of the parents saying that. Now, that sat in his mind or her mind for life. Now, unless that rewiring happens, that unconscious bias, whenever he or she sees a lady driver, will always sit there. So, similarly, on every other element that we do, we have to be very careful with that. How are we lining up children in school? Are we saying shortest to tallest? Or what are we saying? Are we saying just get in a line? So, these are elements that we need to do and a clear focus on rewiring is required and if we are able to do that we'll definitely see change are we changing yes is it fast enough no and can we be faster yes so we have to just make that push from all our ends at this moment of time absolutely you know changing the way we speak which is something that has been brought up also you know changing the way we communicate and not falling into those biases or at least recognizing it when we do being able to take that criticism and it's an ongoing thing as many have mentioned uh, Professor Rao, would you like to make any uh, final comments? Yeah, I would appeal that everybody should have a change in the mindset. A mindset change is required and then everybody should think from a broader perspective so that the inclusiveness can be taken up very easily. Thank you. Dr. Jahan, what about you? Some, any comments you would like to add from based on what your co-panelists have said? Now, by 2045, it is likely that we are going to have a concept of uh, majority minority. So, wherein all of us, all corporate sector, business school, everyone should be able to manage and learn and work with the group, which is going to be majority is going to be the minority. So, that is why we have to inculcate this culture right from now. Correct and B school have to play a very important role and try to work towards creating a better, uh, a better. The world should be created in a better place for everyone to live. Correct without any discrimination and without any difference, treating everyone as one and uh, giving them the freedom to speak and uh, adding values in their work and thereby increasing the creativity, innovation. Because this will also help us to understand the customers better, employees better, and even the employee retention will increase in the organization if we go ahead. And our B-School graduates are going to be uh, entering the corporate uh, leaders. They are going to become the uh, chain makers and set the DI agenda for the future. So that is why inculcating this plays a very important role and it should continue in a large scale. Then we can have a, uh, truly a world will have a better place for marginalized people to live in. Thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Nagabushanam, uh, your closing comments. Yeah, my closing comments are, uh, as uh, Sir said, unconscious bias has to be brought to the, the conscious level uh, so that uh, people understand about this. For this, we cannot go with a mass approach. Like we cannot uh, r- bring DEI through lectures. Okay, it is more so to do with one-on-one and trying to change uh, people. And uh, if you build a confidence, if you build that kind of a confidence with every individual that you are dealing with. So every faculty uh, deals with students 
on a one on one basis and tries to um, uh, eliminate this kind of bias that is there in the minds uh, will be very very useful and we need to be more proactive rather than reactive to situations and it is not about corrections that we do it is about the measures that we take to counter the uh, that is to see that a proper pathway is set in your institution thank you professor ramamurthy your final comments and any advice for people struggling to implement their policies on dni see i would only <coughs> advise that <coughs> you know the we have created a system not just here around the world you know to bring the uh, underprivileged right uh, give them extra opportunities and all that we should not go overboard where it creates a different kind of system where you know the so called majority feel that now they are being discriminated against see that also will create a negative sour feeling right in the society in organizations uh, what it means is that you know then we will never be able to achieve reintegration because then it becomes a continuous battle like you know the preferential treatment and so on and so forth Uh, uh that is why i would always emphasize that you know integration should take place not necessarily the numbers game okay once the cultural change has taken place in the organization uh, where diversity is more a way of life you know as opposed to something that we have to consciously target or achieve i think that probably is the state of affairs i would like to see in uh, b schools in organizations everywhere else thank you Thank you so much for sharing your insights on this. I hope everyone has learned something from it and has some new takeaway. I think we can take one question from the audience. Um yes, please go ahead. hostels where so you know students from such diverse backgrounds come and maybe those might be unregulated you know uh, faculty intervention might not be there uh, any experience on, uh, in terms of you know hostel living and also the second question is social media while students are there they would have formed groups so insidious biases might creep in so any uh, kind of formal policy of b schools to observe those groups uh, so that you know it's nipped in the bud probably i can answer that question uh, yes uh, f- first of all in the hostels i mean i know that how many of you are working for a government uh, institution here i don't see too many hands so we get all these parliamentary questions you know do you have a separate hostel for acst students do you have this so in the iims we don't have that okay we are consciously don't have any separate hostel for anybody although for boys and girls we do okay but in spite of that i think in the past 3 and a half years i have had about two or three cases where uh, a girl student formally complained against some boy students like you know where certain things were posted on social media and all that and we have a disciplinary committee of the hostel there are two three levels so that they investigate they look at the social media posts and all that and we take very serious uh, strict action against the student okay. uh, for example some of them we have said like you know they are banned from any type of club or uh, participation and all that okay. so we do take that very seriously as far as the hostels are concerned and uh, we generally don't have i mean one or two cases will always be there when uh, 6 700 students are living right one or two cases is not something that you can reach although ideally we want to reach that zero uh, it may not be practically possible but we can take corrective actions on that what was the second question you had yes uh, our policy when i drafted it i was very conscious about the social media issue right uh, any type of uh, harassment that takes place on the social media also will invite disciplinary action including expulsion expulsion from the institute okay so i think having zero complaints might indicate a different <laughs> set of problems like you said yeah. having zero explains yeah. yeah 
guys. Absolutely. I mean, but as long as people are coming out and speaking about the problems, that is the goal because most people don't come out because they don't think anything is going to happen. The biggest challenge is suppression, right? Means uh, it's important that people come out and speak. See, one of the things with B schools is that you're dealing with adults. Uh, so you have to respect them as adults and you have to give them their uh, freedom and give them the responsibility and accountability as adults. Um, more from a diversity and inclusion space, you need to ensure that if there is an issue, it is addressed, taken up seriously, and the right protocols and processes from grievance, disciplinary, or the posh perspective are utilized and implemented. You do not take any conversation lightly. But be it um, in the digital space or the physical space, you have to allow them to be adults. Uh, and you have to make them remember that what you do in your personal time or your professional time, in this case, their studying time, is equally accountable. You cannot do something off in a personal time and say, oh, I did it when I was out and don't hold me accountable. But sorry, that's interlinked. So that's something that once you put that into play, once you make the people understand that, the students understand that, the faculty understand that, then responsibility starts uh, inculcating within. And once you're able to do that, I think you'll see success. Just to add, I think, you know, the we also had a similar, a very recent case two months ago. A girl complained about a boy student. So the student of her chair asked me, like, should, it, should this go to the posh committee? So I said, yes, technically we can take this to the POSH committee. There is a separate process for it. The best thing is to call the student and tell her that, you know, she want, if she wants, she has to, she has to, she is the one who has to take it, not us. So she, she was called and the student said, no, no, I don't want to take it. So let's leave it. See, I think sometimes when uh, the week, I mean, this also I would request all of you that if you are a victim, please don't hesitate to speak up. Okay. And you have to t see, it's like you can't make an allegation and then say, I cannot go. I don't want to go formally before the committee and say something, right? As an HR person myself, unless I have something in writing, I cannot conduct an investigation unless you are able to go and then testify before the investigating officer that, you know, this is what happened, right? No action can be taken. I think that is something that we must educate our uh, people. Otherwise, what will happen that the aggressor tends to perpetuate it, okay, and then it keeps going on. Okay? And then they carry forward this from the hostel to the workplace, and from the workplace, when they become CEOs, you know, that carries on right further. Okay? It may be better to nip them up, uh, nip it out in the bud, rather than allow it to grow into a full-blown tree, when cutting it becomes too difficult. Absolutely. Really well said. Thank you so much. And and it was, I must say, it was really good to hear about the how proactive everyone is on uh, situations like this and how much, you know, we are, how open you are to hear about it. And, uh, you know, share, thank you for sharing that with us and the audience. And thank you, the audience, for, you know, asking your questions. I think it really added to the conversation here. And I'm sure we're going to have be having more conversations about this because as long as it's going on, as long as we keep talking, maybe we could, we'll not get to the zero mark, but maybe close enough. Thank you, panelists. Thank you, audience.